Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine. I'm sitting here in the center of San Inez Valley at Fess Parker Winery with two guests today, Tim Snyder, who is the president of Fess Parker Winery, and Blair Fox, the head winemaker. So welcome, gentlemen, and tell me a little bit about where you're located and about the property. Sure. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Um, We are right in the heart of Santa Barbara County wine country, um, which, for those of you not familiar with the area, it's about... 100 miles north of uh, the city of Los Angeles in the southern part of the state of California and it's just a a wonderful, beautiful growing region uh, and we certainly would invite you all to to come and visit uh, whenever you get a chance. Great, so uh, Blair, can you tell me a little bit about how many acres of property and um, what you're producing, the grapes and what you're growing here? Sure, so uh, the estate ranch here is just over 700 acres and we have over 100 planted acres, um, mainly Rhone varieties uh, here in kind of more interior part of the valley, right off of Fox and Canyon. So we have Syrah, Grenache, uh, Morvedra, Petite Syrah, um, we even have some Cunois here. Um, and then we also do grow some white wine varieties like Viognier, uh, Marsan, Grenache Blanc. Uh, so we have some Riesling planted here and also some Chardonnay. And then you also have other vineyards within the Santa Barbara wine region, is that correct? Yeah, so Fess um, established a vineyard in Santa Rita Hills that he named after his daughter Ashley uh, in the late 90s. And then, um, so we continue to source grapes from that vineyard today. And then we also planted um, a newer planting in 2008 of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Santa Rita Hills um, that we call Parker West. Uh, We do source from other vineyards uh, around the area, uh, but really specialize in um, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Syrah, Viognier um, uh, from from Santa Barbara County. And how many cases of wine are you making per year? I know you have a couple different labels, so Tim, why don't you take that? Sure. Well, under the Fest Parker program, we make about 65,000 cases of wine a year. That can go up a little bit or down a little bit, depending on the the size of the vintage and the yields. Um, And then we we have a couple of other programs um, that we do. One is a value-priced Pinot Noir that has, um, you know, a little bit more production to it, around 20,000 cases. And then um, we also have two new additions to the program, uh, our Epiphany program, which is focused on uh, more esoteric Rhone varietals. That's about 6,000 cases and brand new um, addendum wines out of uh, Cabernet base out of Napa Valley. And that's pretty micro. That's, I think, about 600 cases total right now. So, <laughs> And also the sparkling wine. True. I almost forgot festivity. Yes. <laughs> Again, um, very small right now. Um, the total across about five different wines is uh, a little under 2,000 cases total. Fantastic. And I'm going to guess you can find these wines all over the country. Are there any particular markets? Well, we do distribute our wines around the country. Um, We certainly have some strongholds around the the country. We do quite well in California, as you imagine. Um, Texas is a good market for us. The greater uh, D.C. area, Northern Virginia is a nice, uh, a good market for us. Illinois, Colorado, you know, some of the usual suspects, Florida, the Northeast. Um, we, a lot of our wines actually, though, are not distributed um, broadly. We have about three or four that are our main um, workhorse wines, if you will, that you are going to be able to find around the country. Um, and then the majority of what we do, though, actually, we were making in more small lot increments um, and selling them mainly um, through our wine club at the winery online uh, and then sprinkling them to, um, to find restaurants and, and nice wine shops around the country as well. Great. So I'm going to go back to a little bit into your history and your memories. And Tim, tell me your first memory of wine. Well, my, my first memory of wine would go back to my family. My family grew grapes up in um, Northern California. My folks were, I remember them um, having wine around the dinner table um, and entertaining with friends. And, and also I remember driving through wine country in Northern California, and this is going way, way back, <laughs> um, but kind of, uh, you know, back then we would kind of drive around and we'd stop at apple stands and we'd stop at, 
you know, where you could get uh, ciders and things like that. And then we'd pop into wineries along the way. So once, once we were, we were fortified with apples and ciders and things like that, mom and dad would pop into the tasting rooms, uh, and, and away we would go, uh, again, back into the car. So those are some of my early memories of, of wine. And Blair, what about you? What are some of your first memories? I always grew up with uh, wine on the table and my parents were always traveling the globe, leaving us, my brothers and myself at my grandparents and, uh, <laughs> you know, visiting Italy and Germany and France and, um, and then always bringing wine home. And again, it was, it was kind of something that was always part of dinner and part of, and on the table. And then I also remember as a very young boy riding my bike around this area because I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. And they would come up and visit the handful of wineries at the time. Um, and it was a very long distance ride between wineries back then. So <laughs> I remember that vividly as a child. So it was uh, very early in Santa Barbara County's history, you know, for, for wineries and probably fewer than 10 total wineries in the area back then. Wow. And now there's over 300. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what is the very first memorable wine you ever drink? The wine itself, Blair. That's a good question. I'd say, you know, I started out drinking um, Zinfandels, uh, and, and probably it would be a Ridge Zinfandel that uh, my dad has been, like, on their ATP program, they call it, Advanced Tasting Program, I think is what, the, what that the acronym for. And, and so, yeah, so again, during Thanksgiving, I would say, probably Ridge Zinfandel back when I was too young to drink <laughs> legally, but... Nevertheless. <laughs> well, that's what you get when your parents like wine. <laughs> and Tim, do you remember your first or most memorable wine you've drunk? Well, I can give you one of the first wines that made an impression, a distinct impression mm -hmm. for me. Same idea. It was at home, um, a big meal. I don't believe it was a holiday per se, but I think we had family over. And, and my father broke out a couple of bottles of wine. And one of them happened to be a Pinot Noir from Carneros region made by the Robert Mondavi Winery back when it was the original Robert Mondavi Winery. Um, and I just remember that the flavors and the complexities and it was just delicious. And it really, you know, up until that point, I think I had tried a lot of wine and it was fine, but that one kind of stood out and that was, that's one that has stuck in my memories for, you know, 30, 30 plus years now. And traveling the world abroad, in your opinion, Tim, what is the best foreign wine you've ever drunk? Well, I've been fortunate. I've been able to go to some very nice places and taste some wonderful, wonderful wines. I'm going to go a little bit off the map, although Blair might, this is kind of Blair's territory <laughs> as well. But I will, I will say that we had an opportunity years ago to taste several different vintages in kind of a mini vertical of Grange. Um, and um, with uh, then the cellar master, or he was, certainly wasn't the head winemaker at the time, but his name is Peter Gagos, who of course has gone on to be the, the head um, winemaker at Penfolds in South Australia. Blair, what about you? What's the, in your opinion, traveling the world abroad, the best foreign wine you've drunk? I, I mean, I did work and live in Australia as well and, and had some amazing examples of Shiraz. Um, I mean, Rockford stands out to me as the Rockford Basket Press Shiraz was a, was a real standout back then. Uh, but I also traveled through France and and just really fell in the love with like the wines of Coroti. I mean, Cornas and kind of Northern Rhone, Syrah is something that really stands out in, in my mind. So not to put too much pressure on either of you, but do you remember the worst wine you ever drank? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, push those, I push those things out of my mouth. Yeah. There's not enough room in there for that. Okay, so among all the populations of the world, who, in your opinion, drinks the best quality? I mean, I'm sure that they are, uh, you, can, you can go to many different places and, and find fantastic wine and, you know, mediocre wine. Um... I'll give you two quick answers. One, one being that I think um, when you go to little off the beaten path bistros in France and order the local house wine, it's amazing how good the quality is often. Yeah. And you can find a just run of the mill, if you will, very satisfying bottle of wine kind of all over the place in France. So they got to be in the running there. But I'll give you another one, which is um, we do a fair bit of business. And I've spent a fair bit of time up in um, Copenhagen and in Denmark. And they 
just have access to wonderful wines and selections all around the world. And I think the fact that they don't really have an indigenous wine business kind of opens them up and they're open-minded and they import wines from every corner of the globe. And, um, and I've met a lot of people in Denmark that are very enthusiastic about their wine and, um, and like to share it and like to have a lot of fun and are pulling out, you know, a, a wine from, um, you know, uh, Italy followed by one from Argentina. And they're all fantastic. Blair, what's your opinion? I would say, I mean, I think Californians are pretty spoiled and drink pretty, pretty well for, you know, from a lot of different price points. Um, I think, you know, we have... A lot of diversity in this state, you know, from like we were saying before, you know, you got you got Cabernet and Bordeaux varieties and um, that do tremendously well um, into Burgundian and Rome varieties. So we're I think we're a pretty spoiled area of the world as well. Now, you both drink a lot of wine and I'm sure you collect a little bit of wine. What would you say is one of the most valuable bottles in your cellar right now? I have an 82 Grange in my cellar right now. Um, that's probably worth some money. <laughs> those are now selling for, I mean, back when I used to start collecting and drinking a lot of those wines, like they were, you know, in the hundreds to maybe 200, and then now they're in the six to $800 range. So they've really increased in, in, in price and value, I guess. Yeah, I have some Jamé, you know, some Coroti, some Jamé. I have, I, have, I have a lot of Cornas in my cellar. And anything in particular drinking really well right now? You know, I've I've tasted some some older vintage. Uh, I had a 03 Rodney's the other night, Rodney Syrah. That was tasting really really well. You know, those the Rodney Syrah really seems to age well, going back into the late 90s even. And um, we, we've tasted some of those at the winery, and they really seem to hold up. I think like that, that's what's in the ballpark right now too, kind of the 2000 to 2005 wines are tasting well. I like tasting aged wines, so like I think right now like Pinots and Syrahs out of that era, and even you know Napa Cabs and things like that are really tasting great from that time period. And what about you, Tim? What's in your cellar? What's drinking well? And Well, from a collector standpoint, sadly, we drink them all. <laughs> <laughs> Probably before we should. Um, we've gone through some fantastic bottles of wine. I have, um, just kind of off the top of my head, I've, we've kind of gone through phases over the years. So definitely have some pretty interesting um, older Chateau Neuf de Pop that I've had recently, uh, a Beau Castel that I forget the vintage exactly, but I want to say it was about 16, 17 years old, somewhere in there, and it was stunning. Um, we went through a Brunello stage, so I have a lot of, you know, it's pretty nice bottles of Brunello stashed away, still waiting. We, fortunately, we haven't cracked those open just yet. Um, and a couple of things that have been drinking, well, some of these Chateauneuf and um, Southern Rhone um, wines uh, that we've opened recently have been really, really nice. And then also, um, I've we've gone back and tasted, uh, opened some bottles of um, Pinot Noir from throughout the state of California. So some from here in Santa Rita Hills, but also up into like some, some Sonoma Coast type of things um, that are probably, you know, plus or minus 10 years old and really showing nicely. So, big question. What's your opinion about wine critics and scores? Well, it varies. <laughs> Tim is the president of a winery. What do you think? It's, I think it's an interesting component of our business. And I understand the, um, the need for it and um, the importance of it. I think consumers, I do think it's good that consumers are beginning to trust themselves um, more and seek out different ways of learning rather than simply following a numerical pattern um, by someone that their palate may um, sync with or may not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is an evolution that's occurring with, with the consumer here, at least here domestically, and I think that that's, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the wine critics, I wish that people understood that, they're, that we're trying to bring objectivity to something that is inherently subjective. And um, that's the one thing that sometimes frustrates me a little bit. But, um, but you know, it, I mean, overall, I think that good, responsible, well-educated um, critics are great for our business. Anything to add to that, Blair? 
Um, I mean, I think people still do need some direction. There's a lot of wine out there, and there's a lot of wines on on a grocery store shelf. And I think having a numerical, you know, kind of identification of of where that stands within some subjective opinion um, kind of is necessary, you know. And I think it helps guide people a little bit. So while while we agree with some of the scores and we disagree with others, uh, I think there is. I think it's a good thing overall for for the industry to have a look at that, so so people you know have a little bit more to base their somebody else's opinion, I guess, on. So, getting down to wine, quick question: Blair, red, white, rosé. I mean, it's 95 degrees outside right now, so I don't even really want to think about red wine. But <laughs> like yesterday, when I was out tasting, I was much more into tasting, you know, sparkling white rosé. Um, this is definitely rosé weather for me right now. I mean, I think rosé at 95 degrees works the best. Tim? Just depends on the, you know, it's all for us. It's just a matter of the weather, the meal, the occasion, you know. And, of course, uh, a big part of our uh, consumption patterns, including last night, as a matter of fact, are bubbles. So, um, you know, my wife is... You a, beat me to my next question, ah, which was, still or sparkling? Ah, yes, <laughs> yes. We are, we are a Bubbles household. My wife is a huge enthusiast, as is my daughter, who now, of course, is of legal uh, drinking <laughs> age. And um, so, yeah, bubbles are, uh, bubbles are very popular in our household. Champagne or from somewhere else? Um, all of it, you know. Uh, we love... Ch- I mean, you can... Great, you know, champagne is is um, is of course you know iconic and and often fantastic. But we really explored a lot. Um, we've gone to you know different countries of origin, and and then even you know kind of getting out of you know champagne proper. And there's there's some you know cremant and some other things that are lovely, and um, maybe a little bit easier on the, the wallet in the, as well, which is always kind of nice too. And frankly, I think you know what we're doing and what some other producers are doing here in California is starting to close the gap a little bit in terms of figuring out the right places to source the the right varietals and and how to um, essentially, you know, make sparkling wine at a high level from the vineyard all the way through the process. So, um, you know, know, Rotorer up in in Anderson Valley has been doing it at a very, very high level for a long time. And I think there's others, ourselves included, that are getting better at it. And Blair, now that you're making sparkling wine, do you think you'll love it more or less? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely one that keeps me on my toes and makes me a little nervous uh, in terms of making it because every single um, fermentation is in that, that one bottle. So there's a lot, a lot more chances for things to go awry and a lot less control over it. But luckily, I think we're doing it right and it's, it's all working out. But I, I used to drink a lot more sparkling wine than I do now. I think I drink a lot more still wine than, than, I, than, you know, than I do sparkling wine. So I think I'm more of a still wine drinker at the moment. So Tim, um, do you follow all the rules of food and wine pairing or have you ever been rebellious and done red wine with fish and white wine with meat? Oh yeah, we we don't follow those rules that closely. I mean, I you know, I think that there's definitely pairings that that work and enhance and um, you know marry flavors exceptionally well. Uh, that said, yeah, we're if you have you know a really good bottle of wine and a fantastic meal and you want to put them together, we're not uh, we're not so rigid that we're not going to do that. And Blair, um, for those of us in the business who tend to sometimes over imbibe, any suggestions on hangover remedies? <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe you should tell me. <laughs> I, I just try to drink water. That's that's my new mature goal in life is to try to drink water. Accompany your water drinking with your alcohol drinking, and things work out much better the next day. <laughs> you avoid it. <laughs> Preventative maintenance, yeah. right there. So Blair, what do you think that a non-drinker loses out on? by not tasting your wines. A non-drinker in general, I think you're losing out on a lot, but um, it's, uh, I think, I mean, the taste of wine is, is something that is is very interesting and unique and very mental. I mean, it's it's um, it's something you can spend a lot of time with. It's something you can talk to your friends about. It's it's a collection opportunity. It's yeah, it's cerebral. So uh, and and you know, pairing wine with food and things like that. I mean, you can you can make wine taste a lot better with great food and vice versa. So there's there's a lot of different things. And frankly, 
sitting around a table enjoying wine and talking to friends and family about it and what's what's interesting about it and, and what they pick up on it, you know, flavor profile wise. I just think it's good conversation and again, you know, it's and it's a cerebral thing that you can you can have fun with. So if space aliens landed on the property, what what wines from your cellar would you give them, Tim? Do, do I like these? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone are, seems to ask that. I don't know. That's to, up to oh, you. Yeah. Are these friendly? <laughs> or is, is this friend or foe? Which friendly. Are, which opens up a whole other discussion recently. Um, well, I think, God boy, there's um, just top of mind. I've recently um, purchased... Uh, some uh, some Zinfandels from up in the Dry Creek area. There's a specific producer up there, Carlisle, that I've been on their list and love their wines. They're delicious. Um, so uh, just that's front of mind because I just uh, <laughs> just purchased that on my, my order sheet. Um, from here, from Fest Parker, you know, I would definitely be sharing um, a variety of Pinot Noirs. Um, we, we work with a lot of fantastic vineyards and, um, and you can taste uh, side by side by side uh, different um, Pinot Noirs from these different vineyards and have a very um, uh, varied and unique sensory experience with all of these different ones. And I think that that is not only enjoyable, but also um, an interesting educational experience. Yeah. Blair, what would you share with the friendly aliens? Friendly aliens. <laughs> What are they going to share with me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it'd be interesting just to share kind of the wide berth of what Santa Barbara County has to offer from from Chardonnay and Viognier as white wines, predominantly to uh, then even to Pinot Noir um, uh, from the cool areas, and then and then Syrah from from the like where we are now, the more interior areas of the valley. So I'm going to ask you, Blair, a few questions. This is because you're in the vineyard all the time and wine, you know, doing the winemaking and harvest. So each vintage tells a different story. I think you'd agree with that. Um, in other words, do you think, would you say that there are more things that repeat themselves or the opposite each year? Oh, I think every year is different. You know, this year is looking like kind of how it used to be by coming in, you know, two, three, four weeks later than we've seen some of these other vintages coming off of a, a significant drought, then having a decent winter, you know. I mean, every year is so different than it used to be. This will be my um, 18th vintage, and I can't, you know, like with the, from the early days, like it just seems like everything has changed so dramatically. Um, and again, in terms of drought, in terms of timing, you know, how early the vintages start now compared to how they were. So it's, yeah, every vintage has its own thing, you know, whether it's whether it's super dry, whether it's whether there's rainfall, you know, timing. So, yeah, and, and, and to me, every vintage creates a wine that is also so different, you know, from the same vineyard, but an entirely different wine. So do you have any good luck rituals for when harvest is about to start? I'm just hoping we're done bottling. That's the first. That's the first thing, which this year we're in good shape, you know. So uh, yeah, we'll be all finished up and we'll be able to kind of put away the bottling line and um, get all the harvest equipment out and cleaned up and ready to rock. Um, and then yeah, then it's just it's it's just being ready. It's spending a lot of time for me in the vineyard and and choosing that exact point when those grapes are ready, hoping there's no big heat spike or you know torrential downpour or anything like that but in california we're pretty we spoiled <laughs> yeah we're pretty spoiled so i worked in australia and there were like torrential downpours right at harvest that caused berry split which we just don't see things like that anymore you know no. <laughs> are there any signs or omens that you capture each year to predict the outcome of a harvest i don't know signs or omens i don't know i don't get too witchcrafty out there <laughs> Um, not really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty kind of theoretical science minded guy. So I'm, like I said, like I'm just in the vineyard looking at, looking at development and taste and flavors and tannins and all these things and, and choosing the exact perfect time to harvest. So many producers are known for walking in their cellars and talking to the wine in the barrels. Do you <laughs> speak to your wine? And if so, what do you say to it? Um, I, I don't think I speak to the wine barrels. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I should, maybe I should start driving, <laughs> whispering. And um, last sort of 
you know, spiritual type question. Um, a lot of people will read the bottom of um, a cup, tea leaves, and read the bottom of cup to predict the future. Um, if you could read the bottom of a red wine glass, what would you want it to tell you? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I think it'd be cool if, if it told you maturity dates and things like that, when to drink me, um, you know, what, what my flavor profile is and, and how, how much enjoyment I'm going to get from it. So Blair, when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I was actually going to be a doctor and um, was well on that path until I uh, went to UC Davis and took my first viticulture, viticulture class and fell in love with the grape growing side of it and then from there went into the wine making side. So still a lot of the same coursework. I still had all the OCHEM and BioCHEM and genetics and calculus and all the crazy math and science but ended up taking it towards uh, a route where I can't be sued by grapes, luckily. I mean, I can screw them up all I want, and then they have, they have nothing to say. So. <laughs> Tim laughs. <laughs> Tim, what did you want to be when you were little? Well, when, my... when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> yeah. When I was small, I dreamt of being a professional athlete. And the specific sport could, uh, could shift uh, depending on my... You know how things were, but but yeah, I figured out pretty quickly about midway through high school that while I'm you know have decent athleticism, that there are plenty in the world that are blessed with a lot more than me, and um, so pretty quickly I, I uh, understood that that wasn't really going to pan out. But um, you know, still enjoy being active and playing sports and playing different things now. But Such also, as? Uh, what sports do you play well, now? Uh, I still play basketball a little bit, and I, um, I play golf, when, as, you know, not as much as I'd like to, but a, a bit, and um, you know, enjoy to occasionally hit the tennis ball or throw the football or what have you, but most, mostly, you know, I don't run very much anymore because it kind of beat me up, but I ran a lot, and uh, so I still do that kind of stuff, but it also pushed me in a direction of you know, finding something that you love and something that you could you know, essentially make a career out of that. Um, and I've told our kids this, if you find something you love, you're gonna work hard and it, you're, you'll be uh, better suited to success because of that, but it's not necessarily gonna feel like uh, a burden. It's gonna be, you know, a, a source of pride and enjoyment as well. And um, when you're not working, how do you spend your free time, Tim? Well, kind of some of the things that I just talked about, you know, um, I like to, uh, I enjoy, um, you know, activity, golf, or different sports, things like that. Um, I enjoy music a lot. I played music a bit, um, kind of through high school and college, and still enjoy that. I like going and seeing live music, uh, something that I like to do. Um, and then also, you know, these days, this season, where we find ourselves down at the beach quite a bit with our dog, and you know, enjoying that, and <laughs> maybe a couple cold beverages, and taking the dog for a walk with, spending time with friends. And, what about you, Blair? What do you like to do for fun in your free time? Yeah. Do you have any? <laughs> so not, yeah, not that much. So I have uh, two daughters and one, uh, well, both are in uh, club teams. So we do quite a bit of soccer travel. So between Norco, California, lovely Norco and uh, Oceanside and this weekend we have a tournament in San Luis, and the next weekend is in Santa Barbara, and so yeah, so it's, that's taking up a lot of my free time at the moment. And when you're not driving your daughters around to their sports, are there any sports that you like to do? Well, I played um, NC2A uh, water polo when I was in college, and so that was... That was great. There's not a lot of pickup water polo games out there, so uh, and not to say I could even survive in in that atmosphere in a pool anymore without touching the bottom. But uh, I, I mean, I, I do. I like to play tennis with my family. We all play tennis. We kick the ball around. Obviously, there's a lot of soccer um, touches in my household. And uh, besides that, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't really get. I don't have a lot of free time to get out there. <laughs> so, um, when you do have a little free time and you get that romantic evening with your wife, what is the wine you will pick? Well, my wife is very into Syrah at the moment, so that's what we pick. So it's typically a Syrah, you know, from this area. 
She's also got a house palette, so she doesn't venture too far from home. Um, or she seems to be disappointed when I bust out some of these French wines that might be a little more funky than what she's used to. And Tim, what do you pull out for a romantic evening? Well, it's probably going back to the earlier theme. We're, we're probably, Bubbles. yeah, some kind of sparkling brut rosé, something like that is, is probably our direction. So you guys both live in Santa Barbara area. I have to ask, do you have a favorite movie about wine? <laughs> <laughs> Bottle shot? <laughs> well, sadly, like, Sideways, we, uh, part of it was filmed here at Fest Parker. Sideways did a lot for exposure for our region. Um, yeah, that was good. That was, you know, we're certainly thankful for that. We, we, um, we generated a lot of goodwill, um, had a lot of people come here because uh, of the success and popularity of the movie. Um, that was also uh, nearly 15 years ago. That's so, wild. Yeah, so we, uh, we, we've, we've continued to forge on. You gave us a little bit of advice a bit ago, advice you give to your kids. Mm. Um, what's the best advice you ever received, Tim? I guess there's uh, two parts. Uh, my father really instilled um, and was, was bent on instilling work ethic. And I think he kind of you know, gave the advice that the harder you work, you know, the more that good things are going to come your way. Um, you make your own luck type of thing, I guess. You, you know, if you're prepared, if you work hard, your more bounces are going to come your way. And, um, and, and when those opportunities arise, you're going to, you're going to be prepared to take advantage of them. Um, so I think that was, that was really one of them. And, and then the other thing that, you know, I got from my, my parents was, was simple, but just, you know, treat people well and that will um, come back to you in a multitude of uh, facets uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And Blair, what's the best advice you ever received? Well, I think it was similar to what Tim's saying and um, it was it was really work ethic and, you know, from my grandparents to my parents, um, just seeing how hard and, and what it took to be successful and... And then from there, I think, you know, something else I learned, and this is probably mostly from my mother, was uh, attention to detail. So it's just really like attention to detail on everything. You know, I think that's very important. So I'm sure you'd share the same advice with us, but is there anything else you want to add of advice you'd like to give us today? My advice would be discover Santa Barbara County. <laughs> I think that's good I, advice. I think, I think, you know, I think that we're still um, undiscovered by a lot of people near and far that enjoy wine, that enjoy um, the lifestyle of wine associated with that. Um, and this is such a beautiful place. Um, you know, within 45 minute drive one way or the other, you're in beautiful mountains and vineyards and, you know, bucolic um, settings or, or, you know, at the ocean and on the beach in, a, in, you know, the American Riviera. And this is just such a special place and, and um, I would just, I would advise people to make time to come and explore it. I would say, I would say open that bottle, you know, <laughs> you don't need to save it for a special occasion, open it tonight and drink it and then go get another one for tomorrow. So, yeah. Uh, Blair, what's your proudest achievement to date in work or life? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in work, I would say, um, my, my proudest achievement is just the taking entry level wines to that next level. And I think, again, you know, you can get out there and taste some of our Fest Parker wines that are in the $15 to $20 range. And those wines have, have great critical acclaim, um, great press, and I think they're just solidly made, uh, very tasty wines that are also very affordable. Quick question for you, Tim. A table, complete the sentence, a table without wine is like... Well, the first thing that comes to mind is purgatory, but you know, I'm not, it might be a little strong, but uh, it certainly is boring. <laughs> um, two more quick questions. If you um, could name one famous person from any walk of life, living or dead, if they were spotted by paparazzi and a bottle of your wine was sitting on the table, who would you want that person to be? Fess Parker. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> that would have been a true answer for a long time. Yeah. I have a lot of different answers, but I think, uh, I think I'll just piggyback on Blair's. Okay. Do you think we'll still be drinking wine in uh, 2,000 years' time? Sure, why not? Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, just tell me one winemaking region in the world that you still want to explore. Tim? Well, I have a lot. Um, <laughs> 
Well, two that we've been talking about going to, um, Argentina is one of them, and New Zealand is one that, even though we've been to Australia a bunch of times, we haven't not made it to New Zealand yet. And Blair? I would say uh, New Zealand as well, and then Italy. I've never been to Italy, so that's one that I definitely need to visit. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. There's one last question that we ask at the end of a wine soundtrack interview, and that's because of the play that music and wine have together. Um, I'm just going to name two grapes each. I want you to tell me what kind of music it either conjures up or you'd want to be listening to. So, Tim, I'm going to start with the Santa Rita Pinot Noir. Santa Rita Pinot Noir is sort of kind of uh, Dave Matthews-ish to me. It's complex, there's a lot of layers to it, but has good energy as well. And what about <laughs> a Santa Barbara Syrah? Blair. Um, Slayer. <laughs> Speed metal. Okay. okay, Tim, champagne. I guess for me, it'd be like that iconic band songwriter type of thing that you kind of always revert back to, maybe like a Dylan or something like that. And last one, how about Viognier, Blair? Viognier reminds me of Cindy Lauper, like blousey just out there. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And just tell people how they can find you, um, your website, and how they get here. Uh, www.festparker.com is the website. That's the best place to go. Um, and you'll find information on all our different projects as well. Um, and then uh, other than that, we're in Los Olivos, California, and right in the middle of Santa Barbara wine country. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.